distinguished senior lecturer at the University of Pennsylvania School of Design and a visiting professor at Cooper Union, uh, a, an educator, an architectural educator, historian, writer, editor. Um, I, I personally think her architecture culture, 1943-68, an anthology of uh, theories. Uh, the period is, is an invaluable reference book that hasn't been um, surpassed. Uh, but she's gone on to write The Pragmatist Imagination, Out of Ground Zero, uh, for which we have no dates on this uh, volume. And she's currently completing a collection of essays on uh, about titled Architecture Among Other Things, which is about architecture in the Cold War, or not? Okay. Uh, which is about to come out. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, and I'm delighted to be here, and, and thank you to Libero and to Nadir for the invitation. Congratulations on the book. Um, this is a, a kind of pas de deux, I think, with, with Douglas. Uh, it's been done before uh, in London a few months ago um, in a different way, uh, but I, I, I feel either uh, like, well, I've just been called an institution. I feel maybe more like a dinosaur. Um, <laughs> either we're talking about the disappearance of a parents or we're we're talking about the, let's say, appearance of disappearance, and I, I, I don't know which it is, um, but I'm uh, very much looking forward to, uh, to engaging in, in the argument that we, we just heard put forward. Uh, so yes, in certain ways, this is a kind of flip side of the coin. Uh, and given that we uh, are architects here, or many of us are engaged with architecture as such, uh, the disappearance of appearance obviously poses some profound problems that that uh, that we should think through. Okay, so um, yes, I'm going to be dealing with uh, the appearance side of things here. Uh, how uh, how literally and figuratively to approach the exorbitant architecture of Frank Gehry? Call his recent building in Paris's Bois de Boulogne, the Louis Vuitton Foundation, completed in 2014, a stroke of creative genius, and leave it at that. Dismiss it as a bauble in a billionaire's luxury goods empire, a $143 million vanity project, that even a city as well endowed with cultural treasures as Paris couldn't afford to refuse. Treat it as symptomatic of our latter-day society of spectacle. But what kind of symptom, precisely? What, if anything at all, do Gary's ostentatiously complex, morphologically indeterminate buildings signify today? How to, be, how to get beyond the spectatorial wow that brings criticism to its knees? Like the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, the Louis Vuitton's uh, fragmented forms unleashed a hailstorm of metaphors when the building opened. From billowing clouds to cubist sailboats to Melville's white whale, 
One might add, less lyrically, an arthropodic prosthesis fashioned from a giant erector set. Gary himself preferred to invoke Proust as inspiration. Proust? Well, maybe the ghost of Marcel is hovering somewhere around this pastoral memory of the Parisian bois. Um, but in a comment uh, reported in a review that appeared in the New York Times uh, on the building's opening, the French architect Claude Perron summed up the building as, quote, an act of unbridled imagination. Going on to say that when he first viewed Gary's architecture, he was, quote, seized by an emotion so strong that it seemed to come from something other than architecture. Where, exactly? In his multi-volume magnum opus, Spheres, a reflection on the spatial phenomenology of the present, Peter Sloterdijk has suggested that in an age of global financial markets and enormous technological complexity, only amorphous figures like, quote, foams, heaps, sponges, clouds, and vortexes can give form to the contemporary imagina imaginary. Only polyspheric, multipolar shapes have the capacity to shelter the involutions of our collective late capitalist psyche. Now that God's shimmering bubbles, the celestial domes have burst, Slaughter Dyke asks rhetorically, who could have the power to create prosthetic husks around those who have been exposed. Could it be that after the shattering of the Enlightenment dream, in the wake of a disenchanted reason, Gary has created a new carapace, a different material thought for culture to wrap up in? The line that runs from Ledoux and Boulet to Bill Bow and the Louis Vuitton Foundation seems to complete a historical arc. What lies beyond is still uncharted territory. Frederick Jameson put forward an argument that anticipates Slaughter Dykes in his book, Postmodernism, or the Cultural Logic of Late Capitalism. The problem, Jameson writes in a chapter titled, Spatial Equivalence in the World System, is one of representation and also of representability. He continues, we palpably suffer the prolongations of corporate space everywhere in our daily lives, yet we have no way of thinking about them, of modeling them, however abstractly, in our mind's eye. The, qu the closest equivalent James could, Jameson could find for the world system he was attempting to fathom in 1991 was the house that Gary built for himself starting in the late 70s in Santa Monica, to which he happened to pay a visit at the time he was writing his book. Gary's space, Jameson states, confronts us with the paradoxical impossibilities, not least the impossibilities of representation, which are inherent in this latest evolutionary mutation of late capitalism toward something else. That something else again, sublime, unnameable, placeholder for the future. Jameson interprets the corrugated aluminum fencing and chain link balconies with which the architect wrapped his little pink bungalow as an uncanny eruption of, quote, the junk or third world side of American life today, the production of poverty and misery, people not only out of work but without a place to live, bag people, waste and industrial pollution, squalor, garbage, and obsolescent machinery within the cozy and com compensatory domestic milieu of the advanced capitalist superstate. In the incommensurability of this radi radically uh, contradictory material thought, he suggests, the earlier space of modern architecture is, I'm quoting again, worked over, canceled, surcharged, volatil volatilized, sublimated, or transformed by some newer system. Gary, however, 
would subsequently abandon his dalliance with arte povera for the opulence of titanium and glass. Thus, what Jameson prescient presciently senses in his somewhat long-winded formal exegesis of Gary's early work would be both transfigured and transcended in what was to come. Since the late 1990s, Gary's amorphological metaphors, to quote Slaughterdyke, Slaughterdyke again, have proliferated around the globe, from Bilbao to Berlin, Paris to Panama City, Arles to Abu Dhabi, creating a phantasmagoric landscape of lookalikes. In their wake, there have also arisen a host of would-be Bilbaos by other architects, what two decades ago in Bilbao appeared a miracle has become a replicable formula, a marketable strategy, a series of differences that don't make much difference, even if, paradoxically, Gary's signature is predicated precisely on his iconoclasm and singularity. In the high season of postmodernism, Jean Baudrillard characterized the producer's uh, the products of late 20th century commodity culture as hyper-real and simulacral. When the map covers the whole territory, he wrote, then something like a principle of reality disappears. But arguably, the phenomenon of the, uh, of the unreal city, unreal or phantasmagoric city, from Aragon, Benjamin, and Eliot to Echo and Baudrillard has been uh, superseded uh, by something strangely familiar, by something all too real today. Buildings like Gary's have become strangely familiar, inducing a very visceral, very visceral kind of nausea. That's not only because they are everywhere, inescapable, but because they are the spatial analogs of the mediascapes, the technoscapes, ideoscapes and finance scapes in which we dwell and with, with, and with which they are complicit. And I borrow these scape words from Arjuna Potterai's modernity at large. They transcode the relations of latter-day capitalism into existential substance, even as they also cloak themselves in the magical mantle of art. They are the forms of our life, a nightmare from which we can hardly imagine reawakening anymore. If they distantly recall an earlier avant-garde techniques of defamiliarization, even including the nihilistic buffoonery of Dada, they now affirm the power and affluence that underwrite them, radiating the aura of consumer desire. Now close your eyes for a moment and enter Gary's crystalline dream world with me. Did you read the sign over the threshold? Or were you too preoccupied capturing your reflection in the overhanging glass facades as you were crossing the moat? Abandon thought, all who enter here. Leave your intellectual faculties behind you. You're inside now. Uh, part of the crowd, uh, 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 part of the eager uh, but slightly perplexed crowd milling about in the towering white atrium. The art you've come to see is apparently housed in one of those two massive volumes on either side, so-called icebergs. Everything will be impeccably curated. You would expect that in the house of a billionaire. But the art can wait. You find yourself irresistibly drawn upward. Ramp, elevator, stairs, how to choose. All routes lead to the same heaven, the Empyrean realm of the seven soaring glass sails that compose the fractured roof. The stairs will be good exercise. You begin your ascent. Up, up, a little higher. You've arrived. You're just above the tree line. And from this platform, devoid of all function, except to look out, 
You gaze across the carpet of tree to treetops, just like Guy de, Guy de Maupassant did once in the Eiffel Tower, one empty center uh, beholding another, one cipher saluting another, the rising skyline of 21st century Paris, more glass surfaces. And now and then, having dutifully done this, you prepare to make your way down. Down, down, all the way down. Terra firma at last. The glass is splintering and coruscating overhead, but you contemplate this placid basin of water and then continue on your architectural promenade. You perambulate along the canted walls, the slanting struts. You skirt the mise en abeam of reflections. You wonder how all this manages to stand up. People are snapping pictures. You snap them back. Whoa, what's this? Oh yes, someone mentioned the Olafur Eliasson. Is yellow the new white? Recall Ram Koolhaas's escalator in Seattle. Back to Louis Vuitton, and back up again. And now, finally, to check out the art. You almost forgot. Let's go into one of those icebergs. Indeed, impeccably curated. Really an interesting collection. A little eclectic. OK, next. A concert, lunch, look, the restaurant has hanging fish, and it's called Le Franc after the architect. But it's expensive, and there's another line. A postcard in the gift shop should be affordable. Time to go. How to be dispassionate about such an experience. Back on the other side of the moat, it takes a moment to disengage from the circuitry and regain my faculties. You ask, what did I think of the building? Did I like it? A little jaded, I reply. Do you like ramps? Do you like escalators and elevators and stairs? For the real, the true content of the architectural cadenza we just saw, its allegorical meaning and its homology with its time, is circulation. Everything courses through. Not just streams of tourists, but ever larger flows of money, of art, of information. Architecture absorbs these liquid currencies into its own formal symbolic economy. Uh, in being shaped by these forces, it also shapes them. It contributes to producing the contemporary imaginary the cognitive map. Of course, the architecture itself um, looks a little different on the computer screen, um, but it is still beholden to the laws of gravity. gravity. Today's cutting edge architects pretend to forget that. The napkin drawing is handed over to the engineer who somehow makes it stand up. This is what Rem Koolhaas in Delirious New York calls the technology of the fantastic. Meanwhile, the architect concentrates on circulation, on lines of flight and lines of sight, constructing the illusion of dynamism, creating his or her interlooping trajectories. Once upon a time, when modern architecture was young, the circulation system was one function among others, much as it is in the human body. Today, it's the star, the vedette, the feature attraction. In the second volume of the Herve Complet, Le Corbusier coined the concept of the promenade architecturale. He writes in relation to the Villa Savoy, 
Arab architecture has much to teach us. It's appreciated while on the move with one's feet. It is while walking, moving from one place to another, that one sees how the arrangements of the architecture develop. This is a principle contrary to Baroque architecture, which is conceived on paper in relation to a fixed theoretical point. I prefer the teachings of Arab architecture. In this house, he continues with respect to Villa Savoy, we are dealing with a true architectural promenade, offering constantly varied, unexpected, sometimes astonishing aspects. It's interesting to obtain so much diversity when, for example, from the standpoint of construction, one has subscribed to an absolutely rigorous pattern of posts and beams, unquote. Though not included among his cardinal five points, the architectural promenade would remain a key concept in forming Le Corbusier's approach to architecture, especially pronounced in his museum and exhibition schemes. He derived it from his, his experience of landscape, especially, and above all, the path winding up to the Acropolis, which he first observed as a young man on his journey to the Orient, and which he illustrates in Vers une architecture with Choisy's analytical drawing. While superficially there appear to be affinities between the ramps at Carpenter Center, say, and those in today's buildings, it's clear that what's at stake for Le Corbusier is, as he says, an absolutely rigorous pattern is, uh, is the dialectic between, as he says, an absolutely rigorous pattern of posts and beams and the aleatory path of the visitor, between the rationality of structure and the subjectivity of bodily experience. In contrast, Gary is post-dialectic dialectical. Irrationality, or at least its appearance, is everything. If we had more time, we could explore some other 20th century geo genealogies for the architecture of spectacular circulation that we're witnessing today. Wright's Guggenheim Museum in New York is often invoked as a precursor to Gary's Guggenheim in Bilbao. But Wright's and Gary's trajectories are literally very different. While Gary uh, is intent uh, on being polemically nonlinear, Wright's path is teleological and aspirational. The objective of the spiral ramp is the elevation of art, and the path to this higher plane of knowledge and consciousness is very much linear. We could also contrast Gary's system of circulation to that of Mies. Mies has a reputation for being all about control. Yet while the vertical circulation in Mises' buildings tends to remain purely functional, often concealed in the core, the horizontal circulation is open-ended and aleatory. Mies is the enemy of the diagonal. It's hard to imagine a Miesian ramp. Indeed, while Gary circulation offers the illusion of a freedom of movement, Mises' universal space offers the actuality of it. Lastly, we could compare the fantasies, or not lastly, but yet uh, to, to just offer yet another uh, set of examples. We could compare the fan fantasies of nomadic wandering and wayfaring in projects uh, of the post-World War II period, like Constance New Babylon, the dystopias of Archizum and Superstudio, or of Perron and Virilio's oblique function. Maybe that's why Claude Perrant was so moved by Gary's building. Suffice it to say that a history of circulation in architecture would reveal as much about, phenomenal, as about phenomenological experience as about function. With respect to vanguard architecture today, however, it's clear that the circulation system has taken on a new autonomy and plays not only an experiential and functional role, but also an allegorical one uh, in the construction of the fetish spaces of contemporary culture. In an essay titled, Cultures of Circulation, the Imaginations of Modernity, Benjamin Lee and Edward LaPuma write, the fetish is none other than the act of shared imagination in which agents apprehend con cognitively 
and precognitively that the mutuality and performativity of their actions across a variety of domains is what produces society. Of course, there are other things besides the ones we have mentioned previously that produce society and that circulate in our unfathom unfathomably complex and interdependent global system. To name a few, refugees, terrorists, homeless people, weapons, lethal viruses, environmental contaminants. Inside the architectural cloud, though, these unpleasant facts are suspended. Gary's erratic buildings are biopolitical machines of a novel kind. They do their work not by coercion, but in subtler fashion, by seduction. They produce and reproduce us today as we perform within them the rituals of a contemporary culture of circulation. They embody the dynamism and superficiality of the late capitalist world and in their seemingly delirious, but in fact, highly scripted and controlled formal material concatenations, its contradictions. <laughs>